stand as well as standing more comfortable for you. Um, thank you everybody for having the time to make it tonight. I know it's really, it really speaks a lot to me that you guys all care about your children so much that you're willing to devote yet another hour of your day towards being away from home. So I really appreciate your time and presence. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Ms. Roxy. Um, I'm the new lead guide for your toddler classroom and I work with your children every day and I love this group. They're wonderful. Um, and I also wanted to thank everybody again for your patience and adjustment to the change of having a new lead guide for this classroom. I know that we had a number of changes all happen at once. Change is never easy for anyone. And I really appreciate, again, all of you guys' commitment to your children's education um, and your patience as we slowly get used to a little new reality here in the classroom. Um, so I wanted to provide a little background about myself for those of you who haven't yet had the opportunity to attend one of our afternoon tea times. Um, and for those of you who have, I really appreciate, again, that you're willing to carve out more time towards your children's progress in the classroom to learn more about myself um, and our little community here. Um, so I've been working with children since 2006 um, here in um, Santa Clara County as well as Santa Cruz County. I currently live in Santa Cruz, so I make my lovely drive over Highway 17 every day to be here. Um, but it's really exciting for me because I feel like really strong toddler Montessori classrooms and communities are pretty few and far between. Um, so when I finished my Montessori training, it was important to me to be able to share my knowledge and experience with a community that may not have it yet. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Um, I have received my assistance to infancy, that's what we call um, training for guides between the ages of zero to three um, in Portland, Oregon at what we call um, Association Montessori International Accredited School. Um, and that means that the training that I received is recognized all over the world um, as opposed to AMS, which is American Montessori Society. Um, and that's also really exciting because right now I think there's only eight active toddler teacher Montessori trainers um, in the whole world who offer this particular training. Um, that training was about a little, a year and a half long total and worked really hard. Fell in love with Montessori on a really deep level, so I'm really excited to be here. And I'm also in the process of working on my master's in education through Loyola University in Maryland. So it's kind of a remote process and it's like affiliated with getting your Montessori teacher training all at the same time. Then I will go off for a couple weeks, do a bunch of research and have a master's degree. There's a light at the end of my educational <laughs> tunnel. Um, I've been working exclusively in Montessori education since 2012 um, in infant communities. So with babies as young, I think we took them at six weeks. Um, I've worked in a toddler community as a lead guide, and I've also worked in a few primary communities as well, from three to six. Um, and in addition, in the past, I've also worked with special needs populations of children, all under age three, and I've also worked in pretty basic um, play-based preschool settings as well. But as you can tell, I am addicted and in love with the Montessori philosophy. I'm hooked. Um, so I wanted to explain a little more information about sort of the goals of a Montessori toddler community because I know it can be a little bit of a different experience um, to what we might see in a primary classroom where the children are a little older, um, they're learning in a different way where it's a lot more intellectual, um, they can use their mind to reason and learn about the whole world and about academics in a completely different way from our young children who are under age three. Um, so what I hope to provide is just sort of an overview of information that we can all hopefully go home with and have a little better of an understanding of what it is your children are gaining from being in the classroom. Um, if you might have more specific questions regarding like your child's um, development in the classroom or more specific concerns related to your child or more questions about um, the nature of the changes that we've all seen um, in having a new guide here in the classroom, Feel free to direct those questions either to Ms. Colleen or Ms. Amanda. They're wonderful resources to address sort of the overall changes happening at the school or overall administrative changes that um, reflect in the classroom. Um, and you're always welcome as well to contact me via email with more direct questions about your child in particular. So then I can better meet the needs of each of your child, your family, and the nuances of individual families and children. Um, so, the goals of the Montessori toddler community, and I call it a community versus a classroom, 
because basically for however long that your child is here in the classroom each day and through the week, we're basically living together. So at this age, when they're really little, um, the goal is to um, support the holistic development of the child. So we're helping to develop the foundation and the skills for the person that they're gonna become later. So basically really building up a strong foundation of skill set that they're then gonna bring to the primary classroom when the academics really start kicking in. Um, we, here in this classroom, the focus is on skill acquisition or developing and gaining very basic skills and then also developing and gaining information about the world around them, about how people function socially, about how to operate their body, how to conduct themselves in the classroom and be a part of a social group. Um, and then when they get to primary and turn three, they will learn how to refine all of those skills and information. And then again, they're gonna to start to learn the academics. So the geography and history and a lot of really great things that are amazing. It's gonna be great when they turn three, but for now, we really wanna build up really strong foundations and provide a lot of really solid foundation-based information. So when we're helping to develop the child, it's really important that they're getting active experience in their environment. So anytime a child under three is immersed in an environment, they're gaining a ton of information and they are basically absorbing it all and learning how do I fit into this world in relation to everything that's around me? And what can I learn about this plant on the shelf? And ooh, this feels really interesting. Um, so the more active experience they can gain, that's gonna help develop their cognition because they get into an environment, they experience it, it's really exciting, they're touching it, they're feeling it, they're moving it, they're living it, and then it develops their brain. So then their brain is getting a lot of information, then they feel really excited, and then they wanna be in the environment even more. So it starts this cycle where they wanna learn more and explore, explore, explore. Um, so we're really honing in on that sort of nature of a child's mind under three. We are helping them learn the importance of uh, what we call reality-based learning. So as much as possible, we want things to be very real for them. We want them to feel like what a real flower feels like and smells like, as opposed to bringing in fake flowers. We do bring in some what we call replica objects for language purposes, but for the most part, those are gonna be the only fake things that we experience in a toddler community because we want them to touch a real apple and smell a real apple because they're learning language at this age, which is another huge thing we're helping them develop. Um, and so if they can get their hands on the real thing, if I say airplane, everybody in our mind can imagine what an airplane is, what it feels like to be on an airplane. We know that airplanes go in the sky. We all have this idea in our mind of what that means. For a child under three who's never stepped foot on an airplane, they don't have all that information. So we try our best to bring real things into the classroom so they can get as much real information as possible. Um, another thing that we really are helping them to do is grow and develop their ability to concentrate. Um, so the longer we can get a child to stick with an activity, the better, because they are learning self-discipline. So they're learning how to control their own body, control their own mind, and focus on something for a period of time that's very interesting to them. And that's gonna develop a really strong foundation, again, for when they turn three and start learning academic information. They're gonna really be able to sit with something and really absorb as much out of that as they can. Um, we're helping them gain skills over their movement because they basically transformed from our precious little babies that we love to hold to somebody who can now run around and move their body and has all these ideas in their head of how they wanna move. Um, they're developing control over their hands and fingers uh, which is really hard at this age because it's like they know what they want to do and it's just a matter of getting their fingers and their body to cooperate with what their mind wants to do. So we're helping them develop their movement. Um, we're helping them develop social skills and how to be part of a social community. Um, so we have a lot of works in here that allow them to contribute to our environment in some way. Um, and we also work on something that we call grace and courtesy. And we do that through modeling behaviors that we hope to see from our children while they're children and hopefully for the rest of their lives. Again, building a really strong foundation for the kind of person that they're gonna become. So when we're sit down, we sit down and we have snack together, I'll offer them food and I'll say, Billy, would you like some oranges? You can say yes please or no thank you. And then they learn how to respond appropriately. 
and as adults, every now and then I encourage my assistants to sit down and have snacks with us so we can model what we hope that they will learn to do so that the adults can say, please, thank you, you're welcome. Um, and then really trying to build that language. Um, we really want to build children who are peaceful, who are polite, who are courteous, who what, hopefully when other people see them, they'll think, wow, this child has the best manners. Um, and we're building all of those foundations here. So I hope that some of your children have started to say yes, please, and no thank you, and that you're starting to hear some of those social graces at home. Um, we're helping their emotional development. And for a child under three, what that essentially is going to come down to is learning as much language as possible, because the more they can express themselves, the better they're going to feel about their emotional state. Uh, we're also helping their emotional development by de um, establishing consistency and predictability. So I know a lot of the time you might hear me at the door saying the same lines every morning at drop off. Mom and dad will be back after work because that provides information and it helps develop consistency and a consistent expectation. We have our work set up in very specific places. Each work activity must go back in the same place every single time. We're showing the children where to put things, how to operate with things, so that when they want to sweep, they know exactly where to go to find the broom. If they want to do the vehicles puzzle, they know exactly where to go and get it. So helping them develop, develop that consistency and predictability is really important at this age. And then once they feel, <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, so I'm curious, like uh, you're talking about the develop the language, and mm -hmm. uh, in our family, we mostly speak the second language except the English. So do you have any suggestions? Is there anything we need to pay special attention in the language development? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great question. And I've actually been really excited to work in such a diverse community because it's been a really interesting learning experience for me on how to support uh, multilingual households and to see all the different development of each child based on the household that they might come from. Um, that's a really great question and I'll be sure to answer it as soon as I finish describing a few more things that they learned. <laughs> yeah, right. um, the next thing that's really important at this age is care of self. So what that comes down to is how to feed yourself, how to manage your bathroom needs, how to dress and undress, and then how to put your belongings where you need them to be. Um, so we work a lot in the bathroom, um, and a lot is happening in there. And again, I hope we're all starting to see in little ways if they're more interested in putting on and taking off their shoes, helping to participate in how to push down their pants, pull up their pants, Again, active experience. We want them to participate as much as possible and help them learn how to help themselves. So there's very little that we're doing for them, and we will really only do things for a child who absolutely is really struggling to do it by themselves. Other than that, they're doing a lot of the work, and they're working really hard in here every day um, because we're helping them to develop those skills of independence, which is my last thing on my list. The most important thing is that we're helping the children learn what we call functional skills of independence because we want them to be as successful as possible by themselves and in their own right and feel really good about what they're capable of doing. It helps to develop their self-esteem. It helps to develop a positive self-image. It helps them to learn that they can impact their environment in a positive way and be successful and feel really good about what they've chosen to do. And we see it happening all the time, every day, with each of your children when they have the little moment of success. Even if it's something as simple as fitting a puzzle piece into the puzzle, your children are beaming. And they are so happy and delighted whenever they figure something out all by themselves. Um, and again, developing that core sense of knowing that they can do something that they've set their body and mind to is going to set a really strong foundation, not only in their academics as children, but for the rest of their lives. So I'm sure, as a few of you might know, there's some pretty big people out there in the world who got their start as Montessori children and went off and created wonderful companies and had wonderful ideas to contribute to the world at large. So even though your children are under three, I feel like we're doing really important work here and I feel really proud of everybody that you've made the decision um, to bring your child into a Montessori classroom to give them one of the, what I personally believe to be one of the strongest foundations that children can get. Um, for their childhood and for the rest of their lives. Um, let me address your question about bilingual education and language in general. So what's really exciting about children under age three, and this is a special phenomenon that can only happen from three and below, 
is children have the capacity to learn any language directed to them. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. It doesn't matter whether it was in 1800s or 2015. Every single child in the universe has the special capacity to learn any language that they hear that's spoken directly to them. Um, the most important model for language is the adult. Um, so the adult in any environment is the best model for language. And even if you come from a multilingual household or a bilingual household, your children have that special capacity no matter how many languages are directed at them. Um, so what will happen is as they get older and older and older, they will lose the ability to learn any language that they hear, as we might know. I've tried to learn Spanish, and tried though I might, it's just really hard. Um, our children don't have to work as hard. It's just the special mind of the child. So what can support any language development in whatever language you choose to speak to your child? I strongly encourage everybody, to, if you don't speak English at home, continue to speak your primary language. Because when they become an adult, they're gonna become a bilingual adult. Instead of poor little me that really only understands English, and I feel so lost and confused when anybody around me speaks a different language, I have no idea what anybody's saying. It's an asset if your child ends up being bilingual. So continue to speak whatever language you speak at home. Direct the language to the child. Uh, one thing that you can do, if they seem to be um, struggling a little bit in understanding what you're saying, you can just slow yourself down a little bit. So always speak as correctly as possible um, in whatever language you choose. You can slow yourself down. Um, one thing that they love is to know the labels for everything. So the first thing, first part of language and the structure that a toddler needs is basically a lot of nouns. So when they first come into the classroom, for example, they might just be looking around at the clothing rack and I'll follow behind them and I'm pointing out hanger, jacket, shelf, and I'm just giving them words, words, words. Um, at a certain point, a child will go through something called like a noun explosion, and at that point, they can learn up to like eight new words a day, at minimum. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is just speak to your child as much as possible. Um, use correct and real language. So one thing that we do a lot as Americans is we like babyize our language, <laughs> and we'll say like, oh, do you wanna go poopy? <laughs> and then they run around and start saying these little babied words. They don't really, we don't really have to do that. So you can speak to your child completely correctly in a typical and mature way, and that's really gonna help develop children who know how to speak really well, instead of children who have a lot of really babyish language that nobody else seems to be able to understand. <laughs> so, and we all do it. I have a nephew who's one, and let's just say I'm not necessarily a Montessori aunt when I'm hanging out with my nephew. He's so cute and we can't help ourselves, but the best thing you can do is just try to speak to them like a normal human being, because they are a normal person, they're just little. So, for example, like if we have an apple, like you have an apple and I talk to him with an apple in Chinese, will he like get confused about uh, whether or not it's the same thing, or? No, they'll learn that it's the same thing. Well, I'm yeah. sorry, not to interrupt. Um, I'm working on a second third language with our older one, uh -huh. And there's certain movies that she knows by heart in English, and so now she is only allowed to watch them in Spanish. So Spanish is her second language, and then uh -huh. Navajo is her third language. Uh -huh. So she has the stuff that she knows by heart, the movies and the video games, or not video games, sorry, the ABC Mouse games. She knows them in English. Now she's only allowed to do them in Spanish or Navajo. Yeah, they'll learn. A lot. Okay. <laughs> Especially okay. under three. Again, it's just that active experience in the environment. They know that when you're eating an apple at home, whatever word you're using for apple is apple. And they know that when they come to school, when we say, would you like an apple? They know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because something else that I observe is if they have a stronger language that's not English, and their command over that language is really strong, they'll just speak to the adults in whatever language they know and they assume we can understand everything they're saying. Yeah. And the funny thing that happens is, after a while, I figure it out. Like, yeah. yeah. So, the best thing you can do is just continue to speak to your child as much as possible and just direct a lot of language to the child. And it's also really important as well that they get that like real human being face-to-face -face interaction, because it's not quite the same if they hear it through like a talking toy or the TV. 
but when they can see a human face and see how our mouth forms a word and they see like our facial expression and all the nuances that go with that communication, they absorb it better. And it also, yeah, it just helps give the context and it will build a stronger foundation for their language development. Um, something else, definitely keep your questions in mind. And if you, I was hoping to hand out little pieces of paper and pencil so that I could get those kinds of questions that we can later turn into like webinars or things where I can just share more general information with the group. But keep your questions in your head. Um, and if you ever get the chance to jot them down and let me know or email me your general questions, I love that kind of thing. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was give a little insight on the organization of the classroom so that you can just better understand, again, what your children are being exposed to and how the classroom is really helping to support all of those developmental milestones that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the classroom, under age three is actually set up to mirror the areas of your house. Because again, they're transitioning from life being at home 100% of the time to life being in the classroom. So to ease that transition, and again, because we're a community who's essentially living together all day until you guys come to pick them up, we want it to reflect that comfort and consistency just like your house. So areas of the classroom that we have are an area for movement and work, so just like we move around our houses and do what we do, we usually have like our living room or an office would be more appropriate for an adult. For the children, it's this gray area right here and our work tables. Um, we have areas for care of the person and care of your body. So for us, that is gonna be the bathroom primarily. And then we may have a few more works that come in that also address care of the body. Um, actually, here's one of them right here, it's this little table. It's called the grooming table. So that's where we put our tissues, a little trash basket for used tissues, and a mirror so that they can see their body and get feedback about their body and how we're taking care of it. So if I need to wipe their nose or we wipe our faces and hands after lunch, each child stands in front of the mirror and they watch how their body goes from messy to clean and they watch like the mucus in their nose and it gives a lot of feedback about your body and how to take care of your body. People who love to do their hair, I will fix their ponytails again in front of the mirror so they're getting that kind of feedback. Um, we have an area for feeding and eating, which right now we're all eating at sort of like our communal tables over next to the kitchen. And then we have an area for sleeping, which we set up and take apart every day, is we bring out the beds and we put the beds in the same place every day, just like in your house, your bed is in a consistent part of your room so that they start to develop that consistency and predictability, and it's been working really lovely. For the most part, I think everybody knows right after nap where to go find their bed, so it's been really nice to see. Um, we also set up the classroom, the, the Montessori classroom specifically, according to different developmental areas that are specific to Montessori education, which is language. So we have a whole shelf right over there with different activities specifically for myself and my assistants to offer language lessons. And in addition to that, every single thing in here should be a language lesson for them, indirectly or directly. Um, we have an area called, and I've mentioned this in a few of your notes home on Montessori Compass, it's called psychosensory motor. So that means mind, sensation, so things they can feel, and movement. And so the two shelves back there are psychosensory motor activities. This shelf right here is also right now pretty heavy psychosensory motor. So it involves a lot of fine motor using your hands and really trying to control your body and again control your movement. So that's something that we do in here that you wouldn't necessarily, you might have some stuff at home but it's a pretty heavy thing we do in here. Um, we do something called practical life. So again, realistic, active experience in the environment of how to take care of yourself or how to take care of the environment or something in it. So washing the dishes is a practical life thing, taking care of plants is practical life, sweeping, mopping, wiping water off tables, wiping up your own spills, washing the window, which I'm sure every single one of your children has done. Those are all called practical life. And those are the kinds of activities they will see you guys do when you're at home taking care of your own house or taking care of your own body, they want in. They want to do everything that they see adults doing. So we give them a lot of opportunities to do that here by creating special little activities with all the stuff shrunken down to like child size. Um, we have a sensorial shelf, which is this right here. And it's gonna, gradually I'm gonna be building some things up and swapping things out. But right now, we want consistency, so I'm not trying to shell-shock everybody by changing too much at once, but a lot more sensory input. 
So we have a little music box playing the xylophone, things to shake, things to look at, basically using your five senses. And then we have our self-expression area, which is basically art and music. So again, I'm sure a lot of your kids have come home with lots of sticker peeling, gluing, scribbling, painting. Those are all your art activities. Um, so yeah, essentially very child-centered, and everything in here is very meant for the children. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the role of the adults in here. So our goal, again, is to help them help themselves. We want to keep everybody safe. We try to maintain the overall order of what's happening. We're offering lessons and follow-up lessons. We're modeling the behavior we hope to see. We're guiding people and supporting them towards independence and helping those who are not quite there yet. Um, we are language models. It's a very big piece of what we do. And then we're preparing, maintaining, and restoring our environment in here. Before, I, uh, before all the children arrive, I spend about a half hour every day setting everything up Throughout the day, we're trying to make sure that we always have paper in all the art activities. When the stickers run out, we're putting in more stickers. If people spill, we're helping them wipe it up. So really just try to maintain a nice, orderly, like well-humming atmosphere throughout the day. Um, and then, of course, closing everything down at the end of the day. And then whenever we can and whenever it's appropriate, we'll throw in little group activities here and there, such as circle time. Miss Antonia's been wonderful in making sure to run some sort of a little art activity each day. Um, so we have a lot of fun in here. And then a few other details that I wanted to mention just for everybody. It would be really helpful if people might be able to start labeling your child's clothing. So either with a permanent marker or you can buy commercial style labels that are like stuck on your things. You can stick them onto your clothing and you can stick it onto lunch bags and other things that you might want to identify as belonging to your child. Um, if you could label with the first name and last initial. So just in case if we ever have two children with the same name, I will know that it's Evan A versus Evan L. Um, and then, um, a site that I would recommend to buy pre-made commercial labels, it's called Sticky Monkey Labels. Um, and that's something that I can remind everybody in our weekly Cassatt Montessori Compass email. Um, I use them for my own stuff because I live with housemates. So I just stick it on all my stuff to make sure that all my stuff belongs to me. Um, and then I was also going to ask if it might be possible for people to bring in one or two four by six family photos. That way we can create a photo album for the classroom. Um, because some of our children stay in here for a long day. It's long. And they start to miss you guys. And sometimes the children just like to take breaks. So it's nice to have, I can compile all the photos in an album and put it in a little basket. And then they can take a break and just flip through the album and look at all the photos. Um, and they can see photos of their friends. Um, and that can be really grounding for our children at this age. And again, it's a really great language opportunity. And it will help me learn all of your names. Um, so if you do bring in a photograph, if you could write the names of the people in the photograph, that way when I'm describing them to all the different children, I can let them know your guys' names. And then the last thing I wanted to make sure is that everybody is checking your folder. So there at the entryway, we have a little black file box. Um, every one of your children should have a folder inside that box. If you could check it every day, whatever's convenient for you, ideally at pickup. Um, and in the folder will contain um, a small little sheet that tells you about your child's day. And then we might put any information in there from the school. So for example, when we handed out our back to school night flyers, they all went inside those folders. Um, and also we'll put in your child's artwork for the day inside the folder, as well as our ouch reports. So to make sure that you guys are getting those every day, try your best to check the folder um, because you'll know what's in there. Um, so now we have some time for Q&A. Questions? Okay. I've, got a, I've got a couple. Sure. Um, so yes. in the beginning, you mentioned uh, staying in one activity. I was wondering how long do you typically have them stay in particular, doing a particular job? However long they want to. So for some children, they might be working with Play-Doh for a long time. And that's a wonderful thing to see because they've really connected with that activity and their mind is fully in it and they're fully engaged and they're really in a great place in terms of what they're learning in that moment. So we actually strive in here to avoid as little disruption as possible. And I really encourage each child as friends and as member of the classroom 
to try not to disturb their friend's work. So if somebody is working with something and somebody else wants it, I'm trying to teach them the language that they can tell somebody, I'm working, I'm working with this. Or I'll say, look, so-and-so is working, let's go find your own activity to do. Um, so we really want to honor however long they feel like they want to connect with something, we let it ride. Okay. So if they want to wash windows for like half an hour, that's okay. Um, okay. And what we can see sometimes is the child needs to fulfill something inside of themselves. Like they're learning something through that activity and for whatever reason we can't quite understand as adults. They need to wash the windows for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to let them fulfill that and once they feel satiated, they usually will like drop that activity and then move on to something else. And they may not wash the windows for like the next month. Okay. But for now, it's what they're into. So also, if you see on their sheets that like, my child is doing the same thing every single day, it's for the same reason. For whatever reason, they're drawn to that activity and they just need to keep working through it and like work it into their system and then once it's fully in, then they can like move on. So you also mentioned distractions. Mm -hmm. um, that was another thing that was a little, had a question on. So how do you guys handle discipline and um, say like, you're trying to talk to a child and he keeps on doing this or this child hits another child. How, mm -hmm. how does Montessori teachers handle that? Well, our top priority, and as it should be, whether it's Montessori or not, is safety. So safety always comes first. Mm -hmm. um, and according to my training, there's three things that we will always try to um, intervene. As much as we want the children to work independently, there's three things that pretty much must be met at all times, which is safety. We want to keep everybody safe. So if I see danger, I'm going to intervene. We don't want the children to be destructive. So if they're taking the works and throwing them down on the ground, mm -hmm. if they're mixing everything up so that certain things aren't available, that's not okay either because we want each work to be available for any child who wants it. So if I see that kind of behavior, that's another thing where I'm going to intervene. And then we don't want anything that's going to disrupt either somebody's individual concentration or the overall harmony of the group. So I call those three Ds. And those are the times when I'm going to intervene or when hopefully somebody will catch it in time and intervene. So the way that we sort of handle what would be most traditionally called discipline, um, in Montessori we call it freedoms and limits. So they have the freedom to go about the classroom and do the work that they wish to do, but there's limits to what they can do with that. So for example, if they want to play the xylophone, they can play the xylophone wherever they would prefer to sit, however long they want. But if they start taking the xylophone and banging it against the wall, that's not part of the limits of how we want to appropriately be working with this thing. So what we'll always strive to do is show the children what to do, what they can do. So we want it to be as positive of an experience as possible. Um, so I will try to redirect them to what I would like them, to, what I would like to see them do. So oh, I see that you threw that down on the ground. Let's pick it up. You can put it in this basket or you can put it on the table. I try to give them lots of choices. Um, so again, they feel empowered and they learn how to be an active, engaged member of the community in and of themselves instead of me telling them, you do this, you do this. I want to give them choices and show them what to do. And if they're being dangerous to a friend's body or in general, again, I'm always going to tell them what they can do. If you want to touch a friend's body, you can offer a handshake or a hug. So okay. it's very important that we keep them safe. And usually the handshake and hug is like my default go-to for if you want to touch a friend's body. Okay. Uh, another important piece is to try to observe and to try to figure out what was that child's intention in that moment. So for example, sometimes you might have a child that goes up to somebody else, they like wrangle them around the neck and drag them to the ground. Was it malicious? Were they trying to actually hurt somebody? Or did they really just want to give their friend a hug and don't have the control over their body to do it in a really safe way? Um, so it is really important to observe what's happening and to make sure that we're only intervening if it truly is dangerous. But if it was a good intention, then again, we want to help like, oh, I see you really wanted to give your friend a hug. Mm -hmm. Let's try that again. Like, let me show you how, <laughs> you know, which is usually to put your arms out and say, would you like a hug? Okay. So like, try to ask first before you actually go in for it. But I would rather see friends that are like hugging the heck out of each other and handshaking everybody they see than friends who are being aggressive. Okay. okay. So are you encouraging um, 
kids to say apologize to other kids when they do? That's a great um, question. At this age, this might sound counterintuitive, but no. Uh, because at this age, they're still developing what we call their frontal lobe inside their brain, which is the reasoning brain, and it's the part of your brain that allows your body to stop and think about something. And it takes quite a while for that to develop in a child, and that's why people believe that when a child turns three, they're finally able to like sit and really learn because that frontal lobe in their brain is actually developed. And that's why we divide the children up between zero to three, which is assistance to infancy, and three to six, which is primary. Um, so before they've really developed certain abilities to really stop themselves and to really think through something, I don't expect them to be able to apologize because I don't think they've actually grasped that concept in their head. Um, usually the case is that they've learned it socially and they just say it because they've been taught by adults to say it, and they say it without actually understanding that actual true like remorse. Um, not to say that they can't develop empathy, and it's not to say that they can't understand emotionally what's happening in certain situations. So they can absolutely express emotion and understand things on a certain level, and they can understand cause and effect. But I think that when they start to learn what it really means to be sorry, it will naturally emerge. And you can see it in their facial expression that if they feel bad about something, they'll start to feel bad. And then we'll just give them that language, like, oh, I see you feel really bad about that. Or I see you feel upset. Uh, but no, we won't encourage them to apologize because we just want them to learn cause and effect. So instead, I'll say, maybe next time, you'll choose to keep your hands in your lap. <laughs> maybe next time, you'll choose to put that down gently instead of throwing it on the ground. Maybe next time you'll give a handshake or a hug. There's always a next time. We're in here all day, every day, five days a week. There's always an opportunity to learn these social skills. So, so when a kid is misbehaving, I know at the beginning um, they told us that they, they get punished or the pocket, the pocket thing. And what is that? And is that still something you guys do here? We've discussed that. Um, so I was chatting with Miss Amanda, and I think I've also mentioned it to Miss Colleen as well. We have to make sure that whatever um, sort of discipline we choose to use is developmentally appropriate. And if the child is holding our pocket, sometimes that can actually reinforce behavior we don't want to see because they get the chance to be with the teacher. <laughs> and that's really special for some people. So we don't want to do that. For other children, they don't even understand maybe that they did something wrong. Like it was so impulsive and so in the moment, they're beyond that. Like they've already moved on from that moment and they don't even understand why they're like holding your pocket and walking around with you. Another thing too, in order to really support them in all the ways that I mentioned, myself and Miss Antonia and all of the assistants in here, we need the ability to be free with our own body. Mm -hmm. So if we have children holding on to our aprons and our pockets, if we're carrying them around all day, it doesn't make our body available to help everybody else and to maintain and restore the environment all day. So again, I'll just try to catch it right in that moment, help them learn what they hopefully should be doing, and then say maybe next time you'll choose to do this. If it really gets <clears throat> sort of out of control, what I will do is I'll invite the child to sit down at a table and watch what's happening around them. If possible. Um, if they're really upset and very emotional, it's not the time to learn anything because they're in a very emotional state and people don't learn when they're in a negative emotional state. So I might just take them to this area with pillows and the nice soft rug where they can hopefully regroup. Um, or I'll just give them space. I'll see if you're really upset, I'm just going to give you some space. And then hopefully they can regroup. And again, looking for just the opportunities as they arise. So maybe next time it will be a better opportunity to explain that situation. Hopefully there won't be a next time, but yeah. Did you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier the, the independence and letting them kind of um, go about that activity for however long that they want to. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we see is sometimes uh, Julia will carry on that activity well past her bedtime. And we don't know how to, ah. mess, or you know, anything, right? Like if we need to go somewhere and she still wants to clean windows. <laughs> uh, so we need to figure out um, how to do it without, you know, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so again, this comes down to a freedoms and limits lesson. That like, I'm so excited that you're excited to wash the windows, but now it's time for bed. So you can wash the windows for one more minute, and then we're going to be all done. 
So I like to give the children a one minute countdown for a lot of our transitions. So before we come inside, when we're playing outside, they're all having fun there in the moment. And then suddenly, poof, out of nowhere, we expect them all to line up. So what we do is we give them a one minute warning. So we tell everybody one more minute and then we start doing things that cue them in to the fact that this transition is going to happen, like putting the bikes away, putting away the bubbles, and then they start to learn that like, oh, we're wrapping this up now. Um, so a great way is, cues are very helpful at this age, so the more you can offer some sort of a cue, the better they're going to pick up on like what's going to happen next. So for example, if she always has a bedtime story before bed, that's when you bust out the book. And they're like, oh, aha, there's the book. I think I know what's going to happen next. Or if there's always something that you do before bath time, like, okay, I'm going to go hang your bathrobe on the hook. Then they're like, aha, it's going to be bath time. Sometimes you just have to stop them, and it is what it is. That's the nature of life. So you can tell them, I'm really sorry, but we have to stop now. And in a really dire situation, I do three countdown, which I don't like to do it because it seems punitive, but they catch on fast. So I'll say, okay, it's time to go inside the classroom. Please walk with us and come grab a circle. And then if they continue to stay, I say, I'm gonna count from three to one. And when I get to one, I'm gonna come help you line up with us. Three, two, and as soon as I start counting, they just run and come grab a circle. <laughs> the key thing is, again, consistency and follow through. So every one of the children knows that if I ever have to do the countdown, which I barely ever have to do in here, which is lovely, um, that I mean it. That when I get to one, I'm really gonna come help your body find a circle. And if I say it's time to go outside, we're really going outside. Um, so before, or even when we come back inside the classroom, we walk our walking circles around the yard to like gather everybody together. And they know, is that, line is like moving closer to the door we're going inside so i hope you're coming with us um so yeah it's hard and i know especially when they're very strong-willed and they really love to do an activity but that's the nature of life and again helping them to learn the nature of life that everything has a start <coughs> and a finish and sometimes it's just time to be all done so hopefully that might help how does the transition work going from this class to the next class once they approach three? That's a great question. Um, so what I believe we do is when we know that a child is getting ready to transition, either myself or an assistant will start to bring the child over to the primary classroom for brief periods over a short span of time so they can get exposed to the primary community. And then I think, I believe what will happen is that will get longer and longer and longer until they're fully integrated into the primary community. And I believe everybody should get, like when that time comes for your child, everybody's gonna get a handout that provides more specific details on what that transition might look like. And we're gonna link you up with the primary guide of whichever classroom your child's gonna go into. And we're really gonna support you and walk you through the experience. Is there a duration of time that you set or it's up to the child whenever they feel like they're ready for the transition? That's a good question. Colleen, do you know that it's usually up to the child? Uh -huh. And sometimes it's the family. <laughs> yeah, just like coming into the community, it's so unique for everybody um, that we really want it to be, again, low anxiety and a positive experience for the child. So I have a question. So, mm -hmm. well, this classroom, I know like uh, you're the leading teacher in the Miss Antonia. I are the two, I still call it like a regular teacher in this mm -hmm. room, and we have uh, Annie or Hannah comes in and out, and there's some other help. Is that the normal setup, like two, two teachers plus one help? Um, well, the ratio that we try to maintain here is um, one adult <coughs> for every six children. Um, so I believe we're actually in the works. We found somebody who's going to become our consistent third person. Um, but in the meantime, and again, thank you all for embracing what we need to do as we have found that third person. We've had um, Miss Annie, who all the children know and love. Um, one of our floaters is Miss Cheryl, who was, I think she was in here longer, but she's recently returned back to school for the first half of the day. So she comes in as soon as she's done with school. They love her. Again, she's another figure where she comes in the room and they're like, Miss Cheryl! Um, so they really like her. And then we have Miss Mariah, who helps with our nap routine, and she's consistently the person who comes in 
just at nap. Um, so they all know her as sort of like the nap and snack kind of person when they all wake up. <laughs> and she also floats in and out because she helps the whole school deal with our dishes and our laundry. So she's coming in and out of every classroom to wonderfully take care of all those maintenance activities that we are invaluable for. So every time she's coming in and out with dishes or laundry, again, it's like an eruption of like, Miss Mariah! And everybody's so excited. Um, so although we have had some floater staff, they're specific staff that everybody knows and is already very familiar with. And then again, I think we found our third person, and we're all pretty excited to have a third person on board. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I understand that Montessori focus on like developing the, the kids' independence, mm -hmm. um, but is there any activity in this classroom that encourage collaboration between the kids or communication between the kids themselves? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because again, we want to promote children who know how to be very socially well adjusted. Um, in terms of the individual work activities, by and large, we encourage like a one-to-one -one correspondence. So like one child, one activity. Again, because we're trying to grow their focus. Um, and so those one-to-one -one activities really help them be able to do that. But there are some times, again, it comes down to observing the, the children and observing the work that they are doing, that sometimes if more than one child wants to wash the windows, if they're working harmoniously and if it's not a problem for them, I let it ride. Um, if more than one person wants to collaborate on a painting, I'll let it ride. Those are a little more tricky because then I don't know who to send it home with. Um, but yeah, so it's set up mostly so that there is a one child, one activity correspondence. But I'm always observing to see if they are becoming more socially aware and socially connected, I'm never going to shut it down. Um, and then there are maybe like one or two specific activities that are meant to be shared. Um, and again, once I, well, I have to create the activity first of all. but like once it's in here, then that'll be something that two people can do at the same time. Um, there are also things, because we do so much practical life, where it's sort of like inherently social by nature. So a lot of the time, we might have like one person sweeping the floors and one person mopping the floors. And even if they're doing their individual works, they're kind of working like in parallel. And I do see some social exchanges starting to happen. Um, or setting the table, that's something that as many children who want to participate in that can. So we might have like a number of children cycling through, like setting the table and putting different parts of our table setting together. That's okay. Um, we do food snack prep. So that's something that more than one child can participate with. Pretty much whoever wants to come to the table, come on down. And in little ways, I'll try to engage all of them. Um, and I'm hoping to do more of those like small but in, um, sort of intentful and purposeful like small group activities. What type of activities do you do during circle time? During circle time, we usually do three things. We sing songs, we do rhymes, and then we move our bodies. So those are sort of, um, those are really great language and movement development opportunities, and they're really great things that we can do as a group, especially with a slightly bigger group, like 17 or 18. So those are the kinds of things we do. And I want to try to strive for things where the children, again, can be participants as much as possible. So I tend to stray away from things where I feel like I have 17 pairs of eyes just sitting there staring at me while I do like the entertaining. I'd rather them be participating with me. So I try to choose songs that are very simple and easy for them to memorize and sing with me. We do a lot of hand movements. We do songs that help develop um, their oral motor and the strength of their mouth. Um, so songs that might make weird little sounds, but those sounds are helping prepare their mouth for speech. Uh, we do rhymes because rhymes are rhythmic, again, helps develop a sense of rhythm, the language, the cadence, they're easy to remember. Um, and then we move our bodies because toddlers need to move a lot. So any opportunity for movement is going to be good. And then through our circle time, I might teach them loose concepts. So like we might have a song about days of the week. So every Friday, I sing a song that I made up about Friday. <laughs> and about it being Friday, and that we are staying home tomorrow. <laughs> so that's something that I'm helping them learn, is that like the weekend comes. Or we might sing a song about the weather and look out the window. Um, or there might be songs that involve counting or rhyming. But I'm never going to do anything that's a little more primary based and a lot more specific such as the calendar with big numbers and things like that. They're not quite there yet. They're still trying to figure out 
when is mom and dad coming back? So I don't think learning the months of the year, we're not quite there yet. Um, but those are the sort of things that we do during circle time. And I'm hoping to also bring in a felt board at some point, because that would also be a fun way to share stories and rhymes and have it be more visually engaging. Just out of curiosity, is it possible to um, have a list of songs you guys Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. then we can sing it. Yeah, because yeah, the last time he comes home, he's singing, and I'm like, I don't know what, what you're saying. saying. <laughs> and I want to encourage it, right. so I want to sing along with him. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that would be yeah, something that would be nice. Yeah, I think the best thing to do would, to, would be to find somebody who can either like voice, do a recording or a video. Because the tricky part about the songs, even if I give you the lyrics, you need to know the melody <laughs> in order to sing it with them. So hopefully that's something that we can do more of. It's like more videos that I can try to share with you guys. Yeah. Because they do love to sing and yeah. music yeah. is wonderful. So I might just have to cut my next album. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions? I know it's getting late. Too late. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, and thank you all again for coming tonight. Again, we really appreciate it. And we have a little parting gift for you guys. Um, I'm sending everybody home.